I, I don't actually hold any records. I, uh, I tell people who introduce me, I'm so tired of being introduced, that I tell them to make up stuff. <laughs> and I told them the most fun one that ever happened to me is someone got up and said, I had 13 Guinness Book of Records, and none of the questions for that day was about anything I had anything to do to talk about. It was about what records you hold. I don't have any records that I know of. Probably, I think I've fallen off stages more than most people. But uh, anyway, it's nice to be here. Um, my friend Dave asked me to speak after lunch. You're taught never to take the after lunch program. Uh, you're taught never to follow anybody who's talking about more fun stuff than you are. And I follow bourbon, so that's not very good. Uh, if there had been, you know, dumb pet tricks at lunch, I'd have been toast. So, uh, but I, I got this idea that for those Ron White fans in the room, that right after lunch, this would have been a perfect time to be holding a glass up here as I was talking. I hope we can do that. So, uh, what is a culture of competitiveness? I mean, culture are the behavior and beliefs of a group. That's the way it's defined. And so, what we're trying to propose here, and what I'm going to talk about a little and what Dave's going to talk about more, is how do you get Kentucky to focus on being competitive? And I, I've listened to most of the speakers for the last day and a half, and everybody talks about competitive. They talk about competitiveness in coal, competitiveness in bourbon. Every business speaker has talked about being competitive. So I want to try to make sure I understand the room first. How many people in this room, and I want you to raise your hand if you believe this, believe we're in a world today that is more competitive, more globally competitive than any time in their life. How many believe that? All right. How many of you believe that in that competition that you just said was true, there will be winners and losers? All right. Any elected officials raise their hand just then? <laughs> I have a hard time convincing them that they're actually winners and losers. They're all winners. It's a Lake Wobegon thing. I know. I got that. Third, third question for you. How many of you believe that places can do something to enhance their chance of being the winners? That's it. That's all we're doing. And I'm lucky enough to work in a lot of places, have done state plans and uh, four places now, and uh, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to be the winner in a competition that's real. This isn't a joke. I mean, it, you know, there are places all over America and all over the world that used to be competitive and aren't anymore. There are places all over the world who used to not be competitive, and now you look at them and you're like, well, how did that happen? You know, I mean, one of my favorite is Chattanooga. You know, if you went to Chattanooga 30 years ago and looked around, you'd say, dead, gone. Sorry if anybody's from Chattanooga, but you'd have you'd, you'd written it off. You, no way. Durham, North Carolina, where I was an economic developer 25 years ago, same thing. That American tobacco uh, company that he talked about closing down this morning was a million four square feet when I took over in, in Durham back in the late 90s. No chance. It's now, if any of you have been to Durham, unbelievably successful, one of the hottest places in America and just was ranked as one of the top 10 entrepreneurial cities in the country. They didn't used to be competitive, and now they are. So. That's what we're trying to talk about. And so when we started looking at the Kentucky vision for the chamber, oops, we, uh, we started saying, well, we really need to know what the situation is. What are the numbers? What are the rankings? What are the trends? And also, what does the business community think? And we didn't start with this, are you or aren't you, which I just asked you. We started with the question of, man, the the world today is just different. There's a new persistent reality that is just change. And so when you talk about place-based competition, it's different today. It's, we, don't, we don't compete on the same things we used to compete on. The economy has changed. The Kentucky economy has changed. The southern economy has changed. What the U.S. is good at has changed. You heard earlier talent demands and, and workforce. What your workforce looks like around the country is different. What you expect from them is different. I, I think we never expected them to wear pajamas to work, but, you know, my personal pet peeve is pajamas on the airplane, but we were having a discussion at lunch that maybe comfort animals are a little bit worse than pajamas, but I'm not sure, so. The pace of everything has just moved faster than we've been able to figure out. So I, I don't want you to, we're going to talk about trends today, and I want you to recognize that it takes a while to get better at something. 
You can't just say, all right, tomorrow the workforce is better in Kentucky or anywhere. I mean, think about the ramp up for a workforce to be better or for infrastructure to be better or to pass new laws that make your business climate better or, or, or. So what you're trying to do with all of this is anticipate where you're going to be down the road. So I want to start with just some trim spotting. One of our, our firm does two basic things. We do competitive analysis of states and metros, and we try to look at the future. And I'm not going to give you any futurist jokes today. There's a bunch of good ones. But we try to look, and we don't predict the future because, hey, something, some tangential thing will happen out there. We try to look at what the trends are today and tell you which ones we think are just going to stay there. So, you know, we're, we're out of the recession. Yay. Right? We're out of the recession. It took forever. You know, it took 78 months to get back to the job level that we were at when we started. The longest, deepest recession since the Depression. And we made it out last May. So we've been out in, in data numbers about a year now. But one of the things that is very different about this time is how uneven the world got. So there are about 370 metros in the country. On this map, if you're a blue dot, you have more jobs than you had when the recession started. And if you're a red dot, you have less jobs than you had when the recession started. And so while we've gained back 100% of the jobs, in fact, we're a couple million to the good now, we have 176 of our metros who aren't back. So when I go around the country and I ask people to give a grade, and some of you, I've done this in this group before, give a grade to the current economy, you get all sorts of grades. If I'm in Texas, the grades are A's. If I'm in D the Dakotas, the A's are, you know, we get A's all the time. If I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, I get an A, and if I'm in Florence, South Carolina, I get a D. So what happened is the competitive nature of economies have started being very punitive to people and places. And you'll see this a little bit more when I look at different regions of Kentucky in a few minutes, but just the geography of the recovery is so, and by the way, there's no, you know, other than Texas being mostly good up here, there's not much, you know, the Northeast has winners and losers, the South has winners and losers, the West has winners and losers. It's a little bit of everything. It's always been true that education made it more likely that you would earn more money and have a lower unemployment rate. But look at the gaps that have formed. Today, if you have a less than a high school degree, you're still at eight, over 8% 8 unemployment. And if you had a college degree, you never got much over four, and four was full employment. So across America, skill sets, just looking at education, have divided people. I mean, if you're, if you're college educated, for, mo for the most part, this recession ended a long time ago. If, especially if you're a man and you're less than high school, then your numbers are close to 10% unemployment, and we haven't made it back. So one of the long-term trends we have is that there's just an unevenness about the way the economy impacts people today. This chart shows income levels. And this is the last 10 years. And what I want to show you on the chart is if you're in yellow on this chart, it means that over a 10-year period, your incomes dropped, real value dropped. If you're in the blues, they went up. And so nationally, we talk all the time about national economies or even state economies. And what is a, more and more of a trend is everything is localized. And what you'll see is that some states do better at state level things, the funding of education, the funding of infrastructure, whether or not they are fiscally responsible, whether or not their tax rate, their tort reform, their regulations are good. And then below that, you have all of this sort of localized workforce issues and other issues that have become real important. They're reflected, and by the way, anybody quickly notice that the yellow areas are most of the uh, areas in the country that were heavy manufacturing? I mean, that's the, that's the overlay. That's the guess here is the overlay, <laughs> is that if we, we lost a lot of manufacturing jobs, and we lost some of them, as some of the speakers have said, to, uh, to outsourcing overseas. We lost a ton more to technology, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then one of the other trends that is unmistakable in the world, and especially in the United States, is that we've, global, uh, that we've urbanized in the global sense. We've urbanized. Today, of the 3,000 or so counties in America, half the population live in 146 of them. So half of our population live in the little blue dots up there. 
and the other half live in the gray dot. And this is, because, this is accelerating. It's faster and faster. More and more, and especially if you started looking at educated people, younger people, started splitting the demographic, you would find that many of our places in the country are, ch are challenged today by their best and brightest leaving. Now, that's not, it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to be the executive vice president for the Research Triangles Economic Development Programs for years, and I got to know a lot of the people who created Research Triangle Park in the 1950s. And when you look back, people think, oh, it's this brilliant economic development scheme. It wasn't. I mean, it turned out to be brilliant, but what it was was a way to try to keep people close to home. In fact, the fundraising pitch was that we've got these good universities, but your sons are all going to school. Sorry, ladies, but that's what it was. Your sons are going to school. They're having to move up north to get a good job. They're going to marry some Yankee girl, and you'll never see your grandkids again. <laughs> Honest truth, that's what we went out and said. And they raised all the money privately really quickly. <laughs> Today, we face the same problem. If you're in a rural part of Kentucky or you're in a rural part of most anywhere in America, you're dealing with the fact that you don't have the jobs to keep the college grads, your best and brightest go off to college, and it reinforces itself in a faster and faster way. And so you end up with these heavier and heavier concentrations in urban areas. And then uh, one of the trends that I think you'll hear the most about from a reporting standpoint and from a national conversation standpoint over the next two to four years that you haven't heard a ton about in the past is something people are calling technological unemployment. There's a study done, it didn't get a lot of attention a year and a half ago, but it's getting more today in Oxford, England, looking at all the occupations in the world and what technology was going to do to them over the next 10 years, short term, 10 years. And the study predicted that 30% of all the jobs and all the occupations in the world would disappear within 10 years, 30%, one of every three people, the job. Now, I'm not a Luddite, I mean, we've always had this churn, and we will continue to generate more jobs and do that, but when you start thinking about what does manufacturing look like today, there's a lot of machines and fewer and fewer people. In fact, the, the GDP for manufacturing in America stayed the same for the last 50 years. We have the same level of manufacturing we've already always had, we just have a lot fewer people needed to generate that amount. This is what a reporter looks like today. You laugh, there's a company that, I'm, that I've toured that has about 10 people who write all the financial reports each quarter for publicly traded companies. There's nobody who does it. It's software, it writes it out, publishes it. That's what rural health looks like, looks like today, and more and more. Yes, that's, that's what a waitress looks like in Japan today. Don't laugh. I mean, most of the time you get to go up and help yourself now. You don't even have a rural waitress. This is what people in the future, Dave, will look like at Kentucky Chamber. I'll, I'll be on a boat somewhere, <laughs> bur bourbon in hand. M might be coal-fired. I don't know. It could be. It might be a steamer. And I'll just show up here at some little thing, right? Is there anybody in the room who thinks that change isn't rapid and isn't going to impact our ability to be competitive in the future? We could do this for three hours up here, and we, I, I'm sure I could convince you, but I just want to make sure. Is there anybody who just isn't like, holy crap, look at all that change? And that's where we are today, right? And so it's not to be afraid of it. It's what do you do about it? How do you set a state up to be competitive in the future? And I think that generally people have two approaches. The first being the lions. <laughs> is just to assume it'll work itself out. Dinner will show up, it'll be exactly what it is. <laughs> the second, if you're the little cat, is to assume no matter how big and brave you are in Kentucky, the world <laughs> is gonna get you. Now, that's the two ways people tend to look at this. It'll figure itself out, or I'm not gonna do very well at the end of this. 
Now, we said at the beginning that you believe that there are things that places can do. And so that's why we have a pillars of prosperity is we think we shouldn't be either of these. We should do something. So let's look at a little bit of the data over the last few years. And, and I, I want you to know that there's no data. I, I could. I could come up here and show you all bad data. Or I could come up here and show you all good data. And if I was running for office, I'd probably pick one or the other and pick that, right? But we don't do that. We look at all the data. And so the, the truth is that Kentucky does some things wonderfully. They do some things terribly. And they do a lot of things in the middle. That's, that's true of almost every state we do work in. Every state has strengths and weaknesses. And the question is, can you maintain those strengths or can you fix the weaknesses and can you anticipate the opportunities? That's the key. And so population growth, you're not, you know, you're growing sort of middle of the group, slower than Tennessee, slower than Virginia, a little slower than the national average, which is pushed to the edge. You're not a very urbanized state. Remember, most of the growth has ended up in urban areas. And when you look at your state, you know where the growth's been. If you look at job growth, you know, you just kill in Illinois and Indiana and Missouri and poor Ohio. If anybody's here from Ohio, sorry. But, you know, a little bit less than Tennessee, a little bit less than Virginia. By the way, Virginia's last three years' numbers are much lower than yours because sequestration has really taken a toll there. So if you look at short term, we tell people look at longer term if you can. Look at trends, look how they work because little snapshots are, they're fun to do statistical lying with, but they're not really very good at this. And it's true that if you torture data long enough, it'll confess to anything. There's, there's just no doubt about it. <laughs> Look at the last year. We just snapped it for you. And sort of pretty good. 1.8% job growth, employment growth in Kentucky. That's a little still below the national average. Better than some of your neighbors. And one of the real questions we ask every group we work with is, who do you want to be compared to? These are your neighbors. But if we, we could put up there the best and the worst states, we put all 50 states, and we do that with these ridiculous butterfly charts that has 50 states, and none of y'all could even come close to reading it, but it's important to know that. Some sectors you do better in here, some sectors not so good in. Manufacturing's your shining star. You've managed, as a lot of people have said over the last two days, to have a real strength in manufacturing when a lot of people aren't. Your growth rate's faster than the country. Your construction growth rate's about half the country, and that's a reflection of your growth overall, your population growth. So that's something that I'd be concerned about. Everything else a little, you know, hospitality's a little lower, government a little bit higher, but you look at these and you try to understand how you're competitive. Looking at these 10-year numbers, again, real gross domestic product, so real output adjusted for inflation, and you can see that you're one of the better states, and that's because of the strength of manufacturing. You can see that places like Missouri and Tennessee actually lost. Yes, Miss Tennessee lost, for those of you who know we lose everything in Tennessee. No, you don't. You grow some growth stuff, but you don't lose everything. Median income, though, everybody's been losing. This is Virginia. You see the little, little tick up in Virginia, but that's dropped in the last few years as military around Norfolk and defense contractors around Northern Virginia have dropped. But you can see overall, We've been doing a job of generating jobs, but the overall real change in medium income across the country, look at this, nationally, we're down about 5%. So we can have a great discussion, and you should sometime, about what's a good job, what is a good, you know, it, benefit, how, how much does it pay, what do you do? Those are good questions to have in a community, but overall, this is not something you're in by yourself. This is a national phenomenon. And then we, for, for Dave and the board, and you had a big planning group on this, did a lot of numbers around how you do in gross domestic product, and, and that's per capita, and you're lower than the country, you're lower in personal income and average wages, you know, your productivity is about the national average, and your exports are really good. You do a good job of that here, and that's been a focus because of the manufacturing sector. As I said earlier, it's... There's no such thing as a Kentucky economy. There are Kentucky things that impact the economy that are done at the state level. But you know really well that uh, you know, when, when Paul Holmes looks at the state, then you, you perform a little different. And I thought I'd show you how that works. This is Paul's June report. The employment since recession recovery in the mountains is still down 10%. Who's from the mountains in the room? Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. And, I'm sorry? 
little low, okay. Well, we'll tell Paul he needs to add another zero or something, okay. Yeah. So that's since the recovery started. Yes, bottom. Yes, since we, since we since it turned up, and you can see that in places like Louisville and Lexington and Bowling Green, Hawkinsville, almost 10 percent job growth. So play, it's it's uneven, and that's not unusual. Again, that's what you'd expect. If southern southern states are really typified by this. If you look at Tennessee or North Carolina or Georgia or South Carolina, they have lots of metro areas, none of which have the same economies. You go to South Carolina, Charleston's economy doesn't look like upstate's, doesn't look like Columbia's. You go to Tennessee, Nashville and Knoxville and Memphis couldn't be different from an economic standpoint. And so they, they have these differences. But overall, you see a, a much more, the much bigger struggle in some of the more rural areas. The wage and salary growth, again, mountains have been, been hit hard along this way. But overall, pretty good growth. And every... Quarter is it that Dave does that uh, Paul does this or every month? Twice, twice a year. Okay, so good June stuff. Look for the next one in December, and the, the chamber tries to monitor this so they can see how the health the individual parts of the state are doing. When you look at income and level of education, there's a correlation, and Kentucky's down here at the bottom, both in terms of income and in terms of education. That's bad news. The good news is over the last 40 years, you've moved up dramatically. That's, so when you look at these snapshot pictures, it's also important to look at direction. And, and I'm not saying this just because I'm here today, but the Kentucky Chamber does a better job than almost every state chamber I've been at at trying to understand the public policy implications of data. Data, you know, we, got, we do a lot of work on scoreboards and dashboards for people, and they do the snapshot data. It's important to try to understand what does it mean? What is that, what is that going to do? Is the investments in education starting to pay off long term? And the growth rate has said here that they are. Long way to come. The other competitive thing is how do people look at you? I mean, people in Kentucky, you know, you have a, you have a culture of ba I mean, what, basketball and bourbon and little horse here or there, and you know, I mean, they're, they're competitive, aren't they? I mean, you, you are naturally competitive, but when you look, there are lots of different rankings that different people do, and you end up, and I thought, I, I mean, these are all numerical rankings, and when you look, I, I thought I'd pull CNBC's latest one out. I mean, you score poor on workforce because of the, quali the, the quality of the outcome of education, educational attainment level. You score low in, um, quality of life because of safety issues, drug-related issues, and, and probably health issues are driving those things. You score high in cost of living and cost of doing business. They're highs and lows. And so as you look at a, a balanced approach to trying to be more competitive, it's not one thing. It's trying to deal with a bunch of different things. We then went out and asked about 500 business leaders in the state, things going well or not? And the truth is they ended up pretty close to dead even. Slightly more, 52%, thought that Kentucky was on the wrong track. And a little bit less than that thought that they were on the right track. So real split. We, uh, we ask each, we, we did that by of those nine areas. And you can see, as I would have predicted, and maybe one a buck from everybody, I don't think you'd have covered it, the places that are doing better think we're doing better. The thing, places that are not doing so well think that it's the wrong track. When we asked what were they most satisfied with, business said the quality of life in their individual community they're happy with. They're happy with water and sewer, basic infrastructure. They're happy with the affordability and reliability of energy. Sounds about right. When we said, what are you least satisfied with? Regulation and taxes. It's a business group. You expect that. That's the number one, too quality and cost of health care, and then the last one with a big bullet beside it, the worker issue. So let me tell you the good news and the bad news. Uh, the good news is this isn't special for Kentucky. All across America, this is business's top issue today. Uh, the 10% you said this morning, we did work in Missouri, Dave knows this, where we had Gallup go out and do a thousand one-on-one 30-minute -on -one CEO interviews. And number one was the question of skills. And they thought that 
of their high school graduates were qualified to go to work. So that, that sort of under 20% number seems to be the number. Now, I, you know, I, that's a big challenge to try to convert most, big most, of our people to a more challenging, more uh, ready state. You're not in it by yourself. That's the good and bad news. But the better news is that if you work hard at this, oh my, is that the biggest competitive advantage in the world. Nobody's got an answer to this. So you've got a new report to drive a series of actions. If you can figure out how to improve worker readiness across the board, how to improve adult retraining, how to improve soft skills, you will have a monstrous competitive advantage on every place else. And so it's an opportunity sitting out there. We also ask what could be done. What, could, what should be done to help business? Reduce government regulation. Invest more than K-12 education. They, they need better people. Reduce business taxes. Promote right to work reforms came out. Invest more in higher education. You see below, invest more in job training and more work experiences. These were the top group, and over half of them were about improving the workforce. So it is a monstrous issue in your business community. So what happens if you're a business and you want to expand, you can't find anybody to, to come help you do it? Well, you automate faster, right? You don't expand. You move to other places where there's more depth in the business market. I mean, this is a real deterrent to growth overall. And what we heard clearly from Kentucky Chamber members is this is an issue and, and the issue. So when we looked at numbers, we looked at rankings, we looked at trends, the answer simply was that more needed to be done. This, what, you know, we're proud of our state. We're here in Kentucky, especially the business community. We're here and we're dug in and we want it to be better because we need it to be better. So, you know, you find all that stuff up, you have that option, right? Oh, that's not, I, I can do better than that. You have this option. Two people stuck on an escalator, and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! <laughs> we know that we have issues in Kentucky. We know that our workforce is not ready. We know that we have pension issues that are dire, is that too strong? Dire. <laughs> we know that infrastructure is crumbling. We know, I mean, we know all this. Aren't you the guys on the escalator right now? I mean, honestly, I, I get a lot of laughs with that clip, but that's where we are for most economic development activity, is we don't need another study to know what the problem is. You don't need me coming in here and telling you what problems are. You can really, I mean, we, we can print you out a whole database and you can see exactly where you're strong and weak, but the truth is you already know those issues. And the question only is, what are you going to do about it? That's all the question ever is. And there, if you want to believe this, think about back to those communities that used to not be competitive. Are there any of them you think just got lucky? That's just not what happened. They didn't just get lucky. They did stuff. My mother says, my mother's 80-something, and she still, she says, if I use, I use stuff too much as a word. But they do things. They make a list. They started doing things. They invested where they needed to. And so when we came in and started talking to, to Dave and the board here, what we said is this is mostly about finding out what you want to do. It, the easy part is figuring out where you're strong and weak. The biggest part is to figure out what you want to do. And so I, I'll be happy to take a couple questions, but then we're going to let Dave tell you what you're going to do, which is the more fun. Yes, sir. 
I know, yeah, yeah, I guess you need to go back. I don't have any bourbon. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really am sorry. I <laughs> yeah. I'm Mike Benson, part of Leadership Kentucky from Massa County. Uh, one of their slides that really caught my attention was the two states that had no red dots. They were all brown. Yeah, all blue. All yeah. blue, excuse me, beg your pardon. Yeah. And they were Arizona and Nevada. Yes. And when you talk about communities that kind of come back, Chattanooga and, mm -hmm. and uh, Durham, of course, Durham's got three great institutions of higher education right there. Yeah, don't tell, tell Chapel Hill that that, that yeah, pretty school right. that I went to is in Durham, but that's okay. But <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I obviously I'm speaking from my, my vantage point, but I think there's yeah. this inextricable link to the quality of life and economic development sure. and uh, to access to higher education. What have you found in your research, particularly in the southern states, because the south, yeah. as you know, has a reputation among some, but we believe that we, we're, we're in the 89th percentile of a percentage of our, our population that graduate high school, but then we fall to the bottom quartile for post-secondary advancement. Yeah. Um, okay, anybody in the room think that people don't need more skills to be successful in the future? So what percentage of jobs, we'll put you on the spot, what percentage of jobs projected in 2022, I'm just going to have about 10 years from the study, will need a four-year college degree? A third. And the answer is 23%, by the way. 23% will need a four-year degree. 35% will need a two-year or higher degree. Almost everybody will need more skills. So the, the short answer to your question is higher education tends to attract higher income people, higher educated people. Their kids tend to do better in schools. All those numbers are, are correlated. What are the best institutions in Charleston, South Carolina? College Charlie, you know, but yeah. So right. So the, there are lots of methods to getting ahead. Quality of life is one of them. I mean, I don't know a lot of young, educated people who want to move to a place they don't think has a high quality of something. In our firm, we ha we don't we're we're a, the type of firm that has people all over the country. We're small firm, nine people, but we're all over because I don't we we do everything remotely. But one of my my favorite staff member as my research person she left North Carolina because she wanted to rock climb so she's living on the front range in Colorado and she moved because it's great Ted it's great you know I'm gonna work part-time so far that's 50 hours a week that's good I like that as a boss <laughs> but she loves it so I mean the answer to your question is yes uh, quality of life quality of place is completely linked to whether or not you can attract people and you know, there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, the, it, m most communities have something that attr is attractive to somebody else. And so, you know, everybody's not New York and you shouldn't compete with New York. Everybody's not Vegas and you shouldn't compete with Vegas. You don't have to. You look at the best cities, they're all different and they're all driven differently. But what you have to do is be really good at whatever you are. Average, there's, a, there's a, several books out these days about the end of average. In America today, and globally more and more, we don't pay for average. We pay very little for anything that isn't great, and we pay anything for things that are great. And that includes people, that includes bourbons, that includes everything. That's, that's the nature of the economy today. So you've got to excel at some things, and I think that's where we're headed to. Any other questions? I'll come back up after Dave's finished to make sure that there are uh, any questions that tie the two together, but thank you very much. Thanks, Ted. Uh, this uh, next session, or Dave, will be um, brought to you by our sponsor, Brown Foreman, Rusty Chevron, who is their community relations uh, and government um, uh, relations official. He could not be with us this afternoon, so it's my a distinct pleasure to once again reintroduce uh, Dave Atkinson uh, to you. Uh, you know that uh, Dave is in his 10th year as president of the Kentucky Chamber, and in that 10 years, uh, the Kentucky Chamber has grown substantially in many, many areas. Uh, some of you um, maybe in um, coming into the state uh, don't know that he was uh, mayor of Owensboro. He's also held some national positions as uh, chairman of uh, the American Chambers of Commerce and uh, quite uh, a distinctive record uh, all over the country. So without further ado, for the Pillars of Prosperity, Dave Atkinson. Thanks, Bill.
thank you, Bill. Bill does such a terrific job for our chamber, for this audience, for Kentucky. Uh, he's an institution, and we appreciate you being part of the summit. Uh, I told Ted to feel free. I, lo I love to listen to Ted. Uh, he's an economist that you can listen to, and he makes sense, uh, and he has neat pictures. Uh, I knew I was going to follow Ted, which was going to be tough, but then he brings cat videos. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> Although I like the gazelle better. Um, no, he's terrific. I told him to bleed over into my time, and then he ends up short, and so here I am. But uh, he'll come back up in a minute, and we'll answer questions together. Um, this is an exciting time for Kentucky. We appreciate the fact that you're willing to spend some time. Leadership Kentucky, it's great to have the partnership with you all and to have the energy of your class here in this room. Uh, it's, uh, it's terrific to have you. Um, let me comment for just a minute, interrupt the flow from Ted to me to the gubernatorial candidates, by the way, this is a three-part segment here. Um, interrupt uh, the flow just to mention a couple of the previous uh, segments that we've had. Uh, the pension thing, you know, that is a tough subject. I've got a four-hour meeting coming up Friday. I'm on this uh, appointed uh, board on teachers' retirement system, and I have to hang with the conversation. I have to keep the caffeine going because they speak a different language. It's highly technical. It's complex, and it's a terrible problem. Uh, but we felt like that had to be a part of this agenda uh, because it hangs over the heads of all of us. Uh, and I thought they did a good job. I thought they described it in, in very real terms to kind of show the magnitude of that issue because everything else that state government does is affected by that issue, by that problem. So we're glad to have that. And then, of course, the education thing, I don't think it was pointed out, but Gene Wilhoyt, I would argue that he is the father of Common Core. Uh, there was a Washington Post article about a year, year and a half ago. It was mostly about Bill Gates and his involvement in educational improvement. But there's a heavy dose of Gene Wilhoyt in that article about how he had worked with the state school officers from all the states after being here as our guy in Kentucky. He had been up there in Washington and was working with all those and the governors and started pursuing these standards. Of course, it's gotten very politicized. I know there are probably mixed feelings in this room about common core standards. Uh, I wish we could call it something else, and I wish the White House would quit talking friendly about it because that <laughs> creates part of the, an, uh, you know, the antipathy out there. But it's something good for our state. Our chamber's all in, you can tell. We're all in on that. But Gene Wilhoy, we're lucky to have him retired back in Kentucky, working with UK and doing some very innovative stuff. But he approached Bill Gates, and since then Gates has put in millions of dollars into educational improvement, including uh, in Kentucky. And then, you know, as we were planning this program, I said, okay, we got pensions, we got education, we got uh, manufacturing, we got coal. Uh, we need to do something on hamster ovaries. <laughs> and, and so I hope you enjoyed that program yesterday. Uh, I thought Hugh did a hell of a job. Uh, I had never thought of that before. I like the way he explained it, though. You know, we got this green juice, and then we pour it over here. And, uh, um, but it made sense, and it's an exciting story about some neat things happening. And then Spencer this morning on Houchins, you know, he gave me a great idea. Uh, I've got the pension problem solved, and I'm going to wait and speak up on Friday when the cameras are rolling. We should turn the state government into an ESOP company and, let, and sell it to the employees. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, I think. There might be a glitch or two, but uh, that might work. Uh, Larry Clark, do you, will you propose that on the House floor? Yeah. Uh, where's, the, where's the clicker? Did I leave the clicker? Okay, here we go. Very good. Uh, let me first just tell you a little bit about what we decided to do as a chamber, developing a vision for the Commonwealth. And you think, well, how in the world do you develop a vision? You get a crystal ball, how do you do that? Well, it's not magic, uh, Ted described, you know, you, you, you do the data, uh, you look at what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. Uh, Susan just told me she bought a house in Lexington. She said, well, we got to do the kitchen, we got to do this and that. And when you buy a house, especially an older house, it's easy for you to go around with a little clipboard and say, okay, we got to do this, we got to do that, and better fix the plumbing, and, uh, and we sure would like to do X, Y, and Z. And when you get done with that and you package that and figure out what you can afford, you're starting to get your vision, right, for your house. Uh, and sometimes your needs, like fix the roof, 
come before the jacuzzi. Um, and so you have to prioritize and things like that. And that's really what the, this process has been all about. Why the business community? Why would we be involved? Why would, be, why would we be so presumptuous as to say we could develop a vision for the Commonwealth? Well, there are a lot of visions out there. We heard six people in the gubernatorial primaries articulating their visions or attempting to, trying to convince us that their vision was the right way. You've got other players. You've got legislators here in the room. You've got 138 of them in Frankfurt. All of them with not only an opinion on these issues, but they get a vote too. Kentucky Chamber, last time I checked, doesn't have a vote on the floor of the House or the Senate. Then you've got other players that make policy, the Supreme Court of Kentucky. You have citizens all over the state with their own feelings. They get to vote and they put one person in the office uh, over another person in office. And so there's a lot of conflicting in our dem democratic process. So why the business community? Well, for, no, for one thing, the business community pays about 41% of all the taxes. That's the latest study I've seen. I think it was from Ernst & Young in 2012. Creates 85% of the jobs. Creates virtually all the investment and the growth and the prosperity of a state. Now, we're here talking a lot about state government, as we should. That's where we get all our opinions together and make policy out of it, and it's important because they identify where we can do this, where we can do that, what the laws, what the regulations are, and all that. But the private community has a very, very strong role and a voice. Now, as far as the chamber laying out a vision, nobody died and put us in charge by any means. But we felt it was the responsibility of the business community, especially in a gubernatorial election year, to try to articulate a vision. Other states have been creating visions. We looked at several others around the country. Ted's been involved with a few of those, and that's part of the reason we uh, decided to bring Ted on. Uh, even looked at Ontario, the strategic plan up there. There are a lot of similarities if you look into the broad statements, but there, there are differences when you look into the specifics, and I'll show you some of our specifics in just a minute. We picked Ted for reasons that are probably obvious to you now that he's, now that, oops, now that you've heard him, but he's done all this work. He maybe knows the economy and economic trends of the southern United States better than anybody. So he's been terrific, not only as a consultant to us, but as a presenter, obviously. Here's the framework. We looked at Kentucky's current condition. That's what he just told us about. Looked at trends. We asked the business community what they thought. 500 people chimed in. And then we lay out a vision with the help of our consultants, plural. And then we also identify a measurement for progress, which I'll outline here in just a minute. We had a session back on February the 10th. There's Dr. Holliday. He joined us. We invited some opinion leaders in the state to join our board of directors, and they spent five hours together talking about, they went through exercises, what ideas do you have? Just like if you were buying the old house and you had to fix the roof and do the air conditioner and the shower and all that, they were saying, okay, we need to do this, 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 and this. And this is what they put together into a plan. There's Will James speaking and Wayne Martin and uh, several, Stephen Gray. Spent a lot of time. And then we did the membership survey that Ted mentioned, and he's already reported these. I was surprised, 52% saying that K Kentucky was on the wrong track, and with regional variances on that. And then our staff, Ted, and then Bob Gray and Diana Taylor, you heard from Diana this morning, they're our senior policy consultants. And then, of course, Brian Sunderland is our senior VP of public affairs and was heavily involved too. And so they brought a report to our board of directors in Owensboro back in the spring, and the feedback I got, you know, was great stuff, but how in the world, you know, it's too much. How do you get your arms around it? And that's when we kind of distilled it, to use a term of the day. Uh, Kevin, you like that term? Yeah, from Beam Suntory back there. Uh, we distilled it down to four pillars for prosperity. The four pillars are workforce, infrastructure, government, and jobs. That's about as simply as I can state it, and I'll be a little bit more explicit here in just a minute. All of this was to create a culture of competitiveness. Ted addressed this a little bit. I'd, I'd just like to make one point about competitiveness. It's one thing to compete. You show up, you have a good game, you take a shot, you hope you make it, you hope you win, and you go home. It's another thing to compete as though it really matters. <laughs> I tell our senior team at the office, you think we're intense at this office? 
We spend an hour in a staff meeting. Patino's got two minutes in a staff meeting on the floor, and he's screaming the whole time, or 30 seconds. Uh, same with Cal Perry. They, they are out there to win. I mean, they are paid to win, frankly. And this, the, this culture, our culture, expects them to win. And if they don't win, we'll find somebody who can make it happen. I mean, that's the hard reality of it. So uh, creating a culture of competitive, it's one thing to compete here. We show up, we try to do OK. It's another thing to say, we have got to win this. We've got to do some things differently. So we came up with this package of the four pillars for prosperity. Workforce, to create a globally competitive talent development system that produces a healthy and skilled workforce benchmark against the best education and workforce preparation systems in the world. Right now there's some exciting work going on in Kentucky where a bunch of us are looking at Singapore and Switzerland, Finland, some other places, top, company, top countries in their education systems and how do we compare to that? Where do we fall short? Uh, also looking at some of the top states. But a healthy, skilled workforce. You've heard that in spades here at this conference. You know, you hear a lot about the skills gap. In other words, the gap between the jobs that are there and the number of people who are qualified to take those jobs. And that is already a very real and troubling phenomenon, and it's only going to get worse for two reasons at least. One is the economy is improving, thankfully, and so there are more jobs being created by you all. And secondly, re, uh, baby boomers are retiring to the tune of 10,000 per day in this country. So baby boomers are going to get out of the way, and the younger folks come into those slots. So we're going to have an increasing skills gap. There's also a term that you've used, and if you talk to Will James for very long, you'd hear the notion of building workers or, or preparing workers to come to the company and the skills that are needed there. And of course, they're in high schools now doing work study and all that and with technical students to have them prepared. A popular term now is the talent pipeline management system. In other words, just like Toyota would have a, let's say, a wheel manufactured maybe at a plant in Tennessee or Japan, uh, but it has to arrive in a certain quantity, in a certain shape, in a certain color, in a certain style at the back door of the Toyota plant in order to go on the Camry at a certain time. They're using those, and they have very sophisticated supplier systems to help them do that on hundreds or thousands, I guess, of parts. So, su supply chain management. What about using that with the workforce? So that you maybe reach down into the eighth grade and said, this student has aptitude. Or maybe this is where we can guide this student toward a career that will provide them and for their family down the road. And you help them through those technical programs and into a community college work study, whatever. In other words, you guide that and you have a supply of workers the way you would have a supply of wheels for those cars. So that's something we'll be hearing a whole lot more about. And our, works, our workforce study that was released last week uh, starts to address some of those things. Government, sustainable state government. You know those states that I lined up just a minute ago, the different visions? We would be unusual among those states with this item sustainable state government. None of the other ones had it. Why? I think there's a lot of attention here because we're in a bit of a crisis. Uh, I hate to say that, but to create and sustain a state government that is financially stable and creates a competitive environment for economic growth, one that can pay its bills, collects enough taxes to pay those bills, and has a bond rating that is healthy. So if you go out to borrow money for a new dormitory at a university, you don't have to pay more for that dormitory than you should because our poor bond rating. This came out uh, from, a, this was in USA Today, I think last week, uh, ranking states by physical performance. And the black states, if you can't read from back there, are the ones that are ranked poorly. California, Illinois, Kentucky, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, and New Jersey. Uh, the, and they, they link together the unfunded liability of pensions, the rainy day fund, um, how much cash had been put aside. There are several factors like that. How much one-time money they had used to prop up their last state budget, all that was factored into an index and we were 45th. If you just do bonds, we're ranked 48th, 49th, or 50th, depending on which one you look at. 
we're in worse shape than Illinois on some things if you compare our indebtedness, in other words, how much debt we have on the credit card compared to our ability, our per capita income, to pay off our credit card. So it's not fun to get up here, you know, uh, we all love our state, we like to feel good about things going on, and we've heard some good stories in our state, but this is a reality that we're facing. So sustainable state government became one of the pillars. Fourth, infrastructure. 21st century infrastructure to create and maintain a modern infrastructure to capitalize on our state's strategic advantages and to advance its energy agenda. One of our strategic advantages is that we sit right in the middle of two-thirds of the U.S. population. There are people moving in and up and down the interstates here today as we're meeting, going from Michigan to Florida and all, in, everywhere in between because we're beautifully placed. Well, if you don't have good roads and bridges, uh, if you don't have airports, river ports, that kind of infrastructure, then we're not taking advantage of our strategic assets. Um, one of them, and I think we've got to pay attention to, is broadband. We are currently ranked 42nd, Bob, 42nd among states. Bob Gray's our stats guy on this, uh, in terms of connectedness, 42nd. Uh, so how do you start a business in an area that's not connected and, you know, have a website that can do e-commerce? 65% uh, of our population currently has better than 25 megabits per second speed. Uh, 1.6 million do, uh, people have less than that. Uh, and that's a very real factor. It's like the difference between a four-lane highway and a dirt road um, as far as doing business. So infrastructure became one of the themes that we heard a lot about in our uh, brainstorming and surveying. Uh, there's a broken bridge. Uh, that might be, I don't, I don't know, is that from Western Kentucky? Down around Cadence, didn't you lose a bridge down there to a barge? Um, that's not it? Okay, but you had a major problem down there, I remember. The senator from, uh, from that district had to drive around the lakes to get to a constituent meeting. I think it was like 230 miles or something he had to go. Um, but anyhow, major problems with our infrastructure. Kentucky's in a little bit better shape on roads and bridges than other states, especially in the Northeast, older and colder environments, but we've still got major attention that we've got to pay. And the more you pay to bail out pensions, the less you have for these other things. And then last not, but not least, aggressive job creation. And you would expect that. Uh, I would say all the states we listed would have this. To create and implement a customized, that's the key word, customized economic development program that recognizes the potential of Kentucky's distinct regions and industry sectors and encourages and rewards entrepreneurship and innovation. Louisville just did, um, is Kent still in the room? Kent was here, Kent Euler from GLI. They did, uh, I think, Advantage Louisville, the program Steve Williams and some others were involved in that, Advantage Louisville that laid out key sectors, for example, logistics. Duh, you know, with a UPS World Port here, of course you're gonna emphasize logistics. But if you went to Prestonsburg, you might not find that in the mix of your economic potential. Uh, being in the, in, in the middle of two-thirds of the U.S. population speaks to logistics. A lot of trucking, rail, a lot of warehousing, a lot of um, big box, uh, you know, the, the, these, these places that have located in Bullitt County to be next to the UPS airport, I mean the, the Louisville airport. Uh, that's clearly an advantage for Louisville, but those districts that we, the, the regions that we've broken down need that kind of attention and different attention. It not, it's not one size fits all. There are the nine regions that Ted mentioned a while ago, and Dr. Paul Coombs, who's our, he's a retired economics professor, uh, he's emeritus from the University of Louisville, and we have him on contract as our senior economic advisor now, and he puts out these studies. But he and I, really kind of became soulmates in a sense when we were talking about there is no such thing as a Kentucky economy because the regions are so distinct. And so we started looking, well, are you gonna define regions by governmental boundaries or political boundaries, watersheds? And he started a very, I think, logical process. He basically started by looking at where the media markets are. In other words, Bowling Green and Hopkinsville, you get a lot of TV out of Nashville, right? Um, Owensboro, I grew up in Owensboro and I knew more about Evansville than I did Lexington. 
in Paducah, what's the phrase you all use down there that you're closer to five other state capitals than you are to Frankfurt? Isn't that, I think that's right. Little Rock, Nashville, uh, St. Joe. Uh, anyhow, so, so we've got a very, very different set of regions here. And so Paul took those media markets where you get your news and all and overlaid with that commuting patterns of where you shop and where you work and developed his notion of nine economic regions. Now, we could argue about those and say, well, Bullitt County ought to be in this or Bullitt County ought to be in that one. But I think the concept holds that there are at least nine distinct regions. It reminds me, and this is one of the challenges facing Kentucky, I think. Uh, I wish this were original to me because I think it's a pretty interesting illustration. But somebody told me this, and I can't remember who it was, 20-something years ago. Communicating in Kentucky is kind of like going to your grandmother's house for Thanksgiving dinner. You go in, they put the, uh, what do you call them, those uh, things in the table that spread it out, you know. What? Leaves, of course, leaves. And so you've got 10 chairs instead of six chairs and all that. So you go in there to have your Thanksgiving dinner, but all the chairs are facing outward. And if you think about Kentucky, I grew up watching Evansville News. Paducah watches, what, St. Louis, and they have a station of their own. Uh, down at, you go down to Lake Cumberland, and you pick up news from Knoxville. Ashland, Huntington, Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati, and even Louisville that has its own media market has a heavy dose of Indiana if you watch the news there this morning on the TV. So it's like all of us, except Lexington and the bluegrass area, which is pretty insulated uh, uh, in a comfortable way there media-wise. It's like the other chairs are facing outward, and that's why KET, Bill, and some other institutions like the Lane Report in Kentucky are so important for pulling us together. Uh, sports programs at the universities, that sort of thing, so that we have a common identity and a culture together. So the four pillars for prosperity, we said, okay, those are broad. And you say, well, yeah, everybody can agree to jobs. What's so new about that? Nothing. But what is new, I think, and what adds to this um, plan is on page, did you get the little booklet? 17 and 18, look in there. I'll just give you a few examples. We have building blocks, and then we also have measurements in what we're going to call a dashboard. So with the first one, for example, which is workforce, building blocks, there's a list there, and it's a dozen items or so, but here are a few of them. High-quality teachers, early childhood education, research advancements at our universities, rigorous standards we've heard about, and substance abuse prevention. Remember, it's healthy and skilled workforce. And so the building blocks are to build specific things about wellness and an educated workforce, okay? And then in the dashboard, how will we measure that? We're not just gonna put out a plan and say, well, it felt good to put out a plan. We're gonna actually watch this over the next several years. And we have, uh, and I th think that's on page 19. Under workforce, the types of indicators that we will watch. These are things that are nationally recognized. It's not stuff that you know we made up at the chamber that will make us look good or anything like that. It's national indicators of progress. Eighth grade math, high school graduation, remediation rates. That, in other words, that's the percentage of students who go to the community colleges and universities but aren't yet ready and therefore need remediation in math or science or, or whatever. A degree, number of degrees and credentials. That's the kind of thing we will watch, and of course, health rankings that are nationally recognized. There are more there, but that's just a sample. So pillars, a pillar, multiple building blocks, and then multiple metrics that we're going to watch. In, state, in government, sustainable state government, building blocks like, we, we propose a full-blown management review, and with a new governor, great opportunity to do that. Bring in somebody like Deloitte and look at the management structures of our state government and see if they're still working for us. Reform pension system, we've heard a ton about that. Cost reductions in state programs, look for new uh, ways to save money. A competitive tax code and responsible debt levels. There are more listed there, but that gives you an idea. All right, what are the metrics on that? Well, we had a few more there. Uh, state debt per capita, that'd be a major thing to watch. How much have we put on the credit card for each man, woman, and child in Kentucky? Effective business tax rate, unfunded pension liability ranking, state bond and credit ranking, ranking which I think, excuse me, rating, which I think right now is AA negative, or AA minus, and the rainy day fund balance. 
Those are the types of things we would want. By the way, if you have any feedback on these metrics, they're not set in stone, but this gives you an idea of what we're talking about watching. And we will put this up and have it on the internet 24 seven where anybody, whether it's an eighth grade student doing a civics report, a professor, a consultant, or somebody in Japan thinking about locating a plant in Kentucky, they'll, they'll be able to see a lot about Kentucky and how we're doing here. Under infrastructure, building blocks like support the P3, that's the public-private partnership law that we did not get through the legislature last time. Passed the House with Republicans and Democrats for it, failed in the Senate due to some timing and some other issues, but we'll come back on that. Build, maintain physical assets, expand, improve broadband, maintain energy advantage, you know, the cheap electric rates we heard about, and promote energy efficiency invest in energy infrastructure. In terms of the dashboard, the percentage of the population without broadband, I mentioned just a minute ago, uh, a total amount being put into infrastructure, percentage of roads and bridges in poor condition. There are national surveys that tell you exactly state by state how that is. Average commute time and energy exports. Those are the types of things we would watch under infrastructure. And then under jobs, uh, support strategic industry sectors, and those are different in Louisville versus the mountains versus Paducah. But let's identify those, in, in Owensboro Henderson, it's aluminum, that's one of them there. Uh, you know, we talk about signature industries, horses, bourbons, and all that in central Kentucky, kind of get wrapped up in ourselves sometimes, and those are great. We salute them, we celebrate them, but you go to Owensboro and Henderson and aluminum is that important. Increase global engagement and trade, pass right to work, enhance entrepreneurial climate and economic incentives to attract talent. Now, obviously, none of these get done just because you put it on a chart. We're going to have to fill out specific strategies to move forward in these areas with our legislative agenda, with our programs, with our partnerships, et cetera. And the economic plans customized for the nine regions, which we talked about. And then on the dashboard, uh, employment growth, obviously, change in real gross domestic product per capita, change in real wages, in other words, inflation adjusted, manufacturing output, and manufacturing employment. Oh, there's another one, exports per capita. You know, we're pretty strong in exports per capita in Kentucky. Actually do pretty well there. And you know the top, well, I'm not sure it's the absolute top, but one of the major pieces of that, which you don't think of, I don't, in Kentucky sometimes is aircraft parts. It's an amazing part of Kentucky's economy. Some of it's for the military, uh, some of it's uh, jet engine parts, et cetera. So those are the types of things we'll be watching in that regard. We'll put together that dashboard, we'll have it online to where anybody can go and say, okay, yeah, we're moving the needle on this and that, or we're not moving the needle, or we're stepping backwards maybe, uh, and we'll have to correct that. So. With that, I'd like to get Ted back up here because he's the expert and uh, you all can fire questions at him. I'll stand back and listen. Uh, anything, any, any, anything on your minds uh, uh, regarding the four pillars for prosperity? And by the way, we've invited the gubernatorial candidates to come. Uh, we shared this with them about a week ago and uh, asked them, give your reaction, give your view of where you see you're taking the state and that sort of thing. And uh, most of us have not had the opportunity to see them together, and I think this will be a real opportunity. We are live streaming it, so people around the state will be watching it too. Ted, come on up. Questions or comments about Kentucky's competitive position? Surely. Here's one. Yes, sir. Thanks, Thanks for the great presentation. and. Um, Gary Hebel from Leadership Kentucky. I just have a question on the infrastructure. Where, where do you live? Up in uh, Northern Kentucky. Oh, good. Right. Good. Um, on the infrastructure, I guess improvements. You specific, specifically call out the roads and broadband, but you leave out like water, sewer, gas, electric. Can you explain the thought press thought process behind that? It clearly should be there, uh, and there are surveys. I've seen some before in which that is evaluated. Uh, per state, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. He, he, did, you, did you hear him? He was talking about water and sewer. The, yeah, the air, air service, everything. 
Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gary. Bobby Clark. This has been a great conference. I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Uh, you said in the four pillars there was uh, ideas about or, or wanting to set standards related to enhancing the entrepreneurship uh, uh, mindset and enhance uh, the ability. Uh, I wanted to see what you all thought in that particular area. You know my passion on entrepreneurship, as well as when we had the discussion about workforce, uh, one of the things I'd like to encourage is that we also look in the workforce development side, getting more and more uh, folks engaged in entrepreneurial activity to serve business and industry in this state. Uh, I know Governor Brown uh, talked to me uh, five years ago when we started the Entrepreneur Hall of Fame. You know, why can't we make Kentucky the Silicon Valley of entrepreneurship? And I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ted? I was going to say, if you look in the report, you'll notice there's a, one of the trends and one that I didn't do this morning. We did, I think we did three hours instead of the 20 minutes I did this morning for the board. Uh, is the contingent gig, pick whatever w nice words you like, economy that so many more people are going to be working for themselves in the future, uh, even if they're, you know, their two or three major clients are Toyota and something else, they're still going to have to operate their own businesses. So we think that's strong. We think, I think you're absolutely correct that entrepreneurial training uh, through school is a major thing. I think that also has a lot of side benefits to it. A lot of entrepreneurial issues that will be built into their long-range plans around risk capital, ar around regulatory for small business, around funding, uh, risk funding that takes place. So I think the details are still to be determined, but we, we say very explicitly in the plan that it's going to be a, the nature of the future is that you know, a third to half the people in any room you pick out are going to be entrepreneurs in some form or fashion. So it, it's very important. One of the exciting things I see in Kentucky is that some of your local chambers and economic development groups, if they're separate from the chamber, have started entrepreneurial programs and, uh, and venture capital. Um, uh, I know Bobby, who just asked the question, started the Entrepreneurs Hall of Fame in Kentucky, which celebrates those who have been successful in entrepreneurism. Just building that culture where you talk about it, think about it. Uh, Lex Lexington has Awesome Inc. Uh, which is an incubator, or at least that's the way I would describe it. I'm not sure they would, but, you know, th that kind of thing, building it in, and then getting some of your senior folks who have some resources to buy into these uh, seed capital and venture capital funds uh, to help the entrepreneurs along. And they're not all, you know, I tend to think the word young and entrepreneur tends to go together and it just kind of rolls off your tongue, but they're, just think of the people who are retiring, baby boomers in this state, most, well, not most, I shouldn't say it, Many of them with a pension, like retired teachers, state police, state workers, and they retire at an age where they have 20 to 30 vibrant years ahead of them, and they have a cushion to the extent that they don't have to, you know, go out and work at a convenience store to pay the light bill, and they can be entrepreneurial in their own way of something that they've ha had a passion for, uh, uh, and they can finally pursue. So I think we need to nurture all that in Kentucky. How many people in the room have started a business? That, that's our world today. Yeah. Bill Moffitt. I'm Bill Moffitt from Louisville, also happen to be a state representative. I saw your, your uh, degrees and credentials category, and I have kind of a two-part question. One is, where, how do we compare to states around us in terms of having people uh, licensed in trades? Electricians, plumbers, and so forth. And also, is there a push in the, in the plan to get, if we are deficient, is there a push in the plan to get kids that may not go to college into, into different professions? Thank you. I have no idea how you compare, so I, but I'll go look and, uh, and see. Uh, but the plan doesn't presume that everybody needs a four-year degree, but it, you, don't, you also don't score well with four-year degrees. So it's about raising every level. Uh, when, I tell, when I'm asked what the most important thing is to address workforce issues, it's how do you quantify credentials? I think that's the key is we don't know, uh, today, if you graduate high school, we don't know what you can do. If you graduate community college, unless it's in a certain degree, we don't know what you can do. And even four-year college grads, if you have a four-year degree in pick your subject, and I'm not, I, I have a liberal arts undergraduate degree, so I'm not anti-liberal arts, but what does that mean? Does it mean you can write? Does it mean you can computate? Does it mean you can do, what, what does it mean? And so I think it's at all levels. There's no doubt 
that we have a national skill gap in the type of skills that you were talking about. We don't have enough machinists, we don't have enough welders. But everybody knows that one, and we're still not producing enough. But we also don't have enough people with quantified higher skills than just high school that are out there for all the other jobs that people have. And when you heard the manufacturing group today, some of those skills are, uh, uh, we divide them when our firm does workforce, or we have job skills, which are very specific, like you just mentioned. The, can you, are you a machinist, can you do that? We have work skills, communication, problem solving, teamwork, all that. And then we have those life skills, soft skills. Uh, we, like, we like skills your mama should have taught you as a theme. Um, and, uh, and we're missing all three. And so any strategy needs to look at all three, and it needs to look at credentials and degrees, all the way up to science, STEM degrees at the top, down to quantifying high school degrees with more applicable uh, skills as you come out of high school for different jobs. Uh, Phil, I would claim ignorance, too, on the number, of, as you mentioned, of uh, um, electricians, et cetera. But the other day, our workforce team, Diana and myself, uh, and another person or two had a conference call with the U.S. Chamber that's doing some interesting work on workforce. And it became clear to me during that call that one of the things we've got to do in Kentucky, and really across the country, but in Kentucky we need to focus on trying to identify the industry credentials that are most valued and most accepted. Uh, and in some job or occupational categories, a credential is more important than a degree. And so trying to find out from industry, trying to find out from uh, healthcare institutions, for example, what credentials they value, what they need, what the pipeline is for those credentials. Uh, they might need a certain number of people in, uh, uh, certified in a certain software application, uh, and they are having trouble getting that. Well, that tells us in the community college system and others something that needs to be done. Now, the Council on Post-Secondary Education and Bob King's back there, they've done some work in terms of the pipeline of engineers and how many positions are needed in Kentucky per year. And that's, so there is some occupational data available uh, relating to uh, jobs and specific skills needed. But I think this whole issue of credentialing and standardizing so that if you went to the Owensboro-Henderson area and asked the HR directors at the aluminum plants there, where are you struggling? What credentials matter? Do you look for associate degrees, BA degrees, BS degrees, or software certifications? That's the discussion we need to have at the local level, or regional level at least. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Rita Johnson with Kentucky SHRM. And in Hardin County, our schools have the work ethics certification. Yes. And I'm curious, how are the other counties or cities going to partner together you know what's working in these other counties because I don't think it's great to recreate the wheel if something is working so I didn't know what's the connection with that uh, that Hardin County program showed up in our research for the study we did uh, I don't know if it's mentioned in our workforce report but it, it showed up and I think the way I would describe the workforce ethics or character or soft skills however you describe it that's a patchwork around Kentucky at best. Uh, there's no state curriculum, at least we were not able to find a state curriculum that addresses that and says every eighth grade student will learn X. Um, Gene Wilhoyt, who we heard from yesterday, in his new work at UK is doing some of that exact analysis, finding out what is needed in terms of soft skills and how do you build it across a um, middle school or high school curriculum. So we're not there yet, uh, but we need to look at models like that and figure out. It's my understanding that Hardin uh, Community College in Elizabethtown has built that across a lot of their courses, that it's a component of. Were you talking about the? Yeah, we're talking about the secondary school, school, okay, in secondary, yeah, okay. Well, apparently it's rubbed off on the community college because I've heard of it in both settings, but uh, we've got a lot of work to do there. And as our survey showed, what was it, 26 or 28 percent of employers said that was their top issue, soft skills. One of the things we haven't talked about a lot with work uh, skills today is that there's a lot, there's an information gap out there, and we're, we're trying to fill it for what we know and what we tell legislators and work with it. But parents don't know. They don't know what skills are needed. They don't know what jobs are going to be there in the future. I mean, there's a huge information gap, and in a society that is a 
overwhelmed with information, how we get that message out is going to be a key. Because if you're an eight, if you're a parent of an eighth grader today, and they say they, they you have a great one, and they walk into the kitchen and say, "Mom, what should I study so I get a good job in the future?" That's a hard question, and so. Trying to look at those longer trends is also part of this, to, to make yeah. sure we can look approach this from a demand focus, the business focus, but also shed that light out so that people can, uh, across the state, can get some benefit from it. There's Jared Arnett back there from SOAR, Thank saving you. our Appalachian region. Shaping, shaping. Shaping, yeah, not saving. Shaping. <laughs> we'll do our best. Um, but seeing the chart that came up on the screen, and he had the nine regions, and seeing that mountain region and the, that bright red, uh, following with the theme of the summit, I felt God tell me to come and make a few comments. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, feel called? So I'm uh, the executive director of SOAR, and we're right in the heart of that region, a real part of the part of the state. And I sat here at this summit two years ago. I was uh, president of the Southeast Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, and there was an executive from Xerox that gave a presentation. Yeah. Connie Harvey. Yeah, and she gave, um, she was talking about Xerox and their experience in innovation, how they turned a the company around. They do completely different products and services than when they started. And she had a quote in there that said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And that was something I took back with me that's uh, really driven everything I've done since then in our region. I think that's what we're talking about here in this effort is that we're not going to sit and wait and see what's going to happen. Um, so we saw that negative 10 percent, I think, and I th think it'd be important to say that that region didn't see the same recession the rest of the country saw because of the uh, the coal economy that was there. Our recession has happened while everybody else was going up, we were going down, which is obvious. But we hadn't we hadn't made the downward spiral at the beginning. We'd held pretty steady. Um, so we've made a solid movement assembling a, a team to do this work within the region over the last two years with uh, the governor and congressman's effort. Uh, so I, I guess my question, um, most importantly, I think this shows how important our effort is for the entire state. Yeah. To see that big of a piece of the state that, that's struggling and challenging, that's important to all of us. Um, but how, how do we integrate such a different economy and the challenges we have there into this overall, overall strategy uh, within the pillars of prosperity and what the chamber is going to be doing. Thanks. Thank you for your comments, uh, Jared. Um, I've never seen a public-private partnership with so much momentum as SOAR, and I commend Congressman Hal Rogers and Governor Steve Bashir on putting that together, Republican, Democrat, uh, business, community, uh, public, uh, the community colleges, universities. Uh, and so if there's hope, I think it's in that kind of movement. And you all have done a great job of identifying strategies and that sort of thing. Uh, having you involved in things like this and Leadership Kentucky through the Kentucky Chamber, uh, having Eastern Kentucky leaders engaged in the dialogue, I think is part of it too. Uh, not just to get your piece of the pie, but also to be a part of the thought process that leads to a better day. So I think the SOAR, I mean, that's the vehicle. I know there's, you know, always some skepticism. Well, we tried this before, and everybody's just talking, and, you know. But if it's going to happen, I think it's going to happen on that platform. Ted, any comments about uh, the The quote you gave is one of the two that are on my wall at home. Uh, I collect quotes. But the, the other one is a Teddy Roosevelt quote that says, do what you can with what you have where you are. And, uh, and I, I've got a comment I've added to it and say every day. And so the answer is it's a nuanced strategy. Certainly what works for Bowling Green isn't going to fix the mountain region. So you're going to have to find specific things. But it's, it's two levels. I mean, there are things that are in the Kentucky plan that need to be done at the Kentucky level that are going to impact you. There are things that are going to be done at the national level that clearly impact you. But there's also going to have to be some very nuanced plans just for your region. And I think that was one of the things, uh, it's one of the struggles we have when we talk to states a, a lot that, uh, you know, one, the one size fits all, the rising, the rising tide doesn't lift all the boats. It lifts all the boats that are seaworthy. The, one, <laughs> the ones that have holes in them sink 
further. I hadn't heard that one before. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a mine. I mean, I, I've been hearing this for years, that if you just make it good for some people, it's good for everybody. Well, every mall in America has got some store closing today. So Nordstrom's might be doing well, but somebody's not. And so you've got to have a strategy for each part, and you just can't have one. So that's one of the great things about this plan that I'm, that I'm proud of that the chamber put in is that there's a nuance for the different regions of the state. I think that's helpful. Uh, Bill, do we have time for one more question? The Consul General from Canada, who has made this the International Business Summit, because he's here with us, has a question, and then we'll play a couple of cat videos, and then we'll get on with the uh, uh, gubernatorial candidates. Uh, I'm here representing your largest customer. That's right. Canada buys more from uh, Kentucky than the next three countries combined, and there's a, over 112 people in Kentucky, 112,000 people in Kentucky whose jobs depend on trade with Canada or are working for Canadian firms here. Um, what I'm interested, I've looked at uh, this four pillars. It's very interesting. It's uh, obviously a step forward. Um, but global trade is just one small line. And I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about uh, where you see uh, Kentucky going in global trade. Thanks. Uh, the first draft of this plan was 10 times this length. Does that yeah. sound right? All that wasted time with me. But uh, no, I, I think every line that ended up in the final plan is an important line. So uh, what we tell every client is that your businesses are already doing a pretty good job here with exports, but they understand that their marketplace is global today. And so uh, Kentucky, the economic development groups here and the, and the other groups that encourage export and trade and foreign direct investment, they're all going to be more important to everybody as we go forward. Uh, most states are starting to figure that out. I do a lot of work with the uh, Organization for International Investment out of D.C. It's one of our other clients. And they represent uh, most of the multinationals in America that are, that are trying to make sure that trade policy, tax policy, uh, all regulatory policy are fair to international companies. And uh, as we, you know, today we were doing work in Missouri about the time that Budweiser quit being Missouri and started being something. You know, I, mean, I, I tell people a story that I own, used to own a Chrysler. And when I bought it, it was American. Then I think it became German, Italian. Somewhere along the way, the citizens of America owned it. And then finally, it was an American car again. And I could be proud that I ran it, drove an American car. That's the world we live in. And uh, the Toyota made here probably has a higher number of uh, percentage of American parts. And we live in a world that is globalized. I didn't do much on globalization today because you hear it all the time. But global it's not just globalization. It's not just a flat world. It's global, global interdependence. I mean, we are interdependent with other countries and, and how they rise and fall. And so uh, you sure hope that people see where the markets are going forward. Uh, America's growing slower. And so the other markets are going to be where most of the action is. I'm glad you asked that question because I think it allows us to end on a uh, high note. Kentucky uh, punches above its weight on exports per capita. The figures I've seen are somewhere ranked seventh or eighth among states in per capita exports. And we think of bourbon. Uh, we think of horses some. You go to Dubai and half the horses at Sheikh Mohammed's stables are bred in Kentucky. Uh, but think soybeans, think aluminum. Uh, the agricultural community has really led the way. I can't remember the exact statistic, but I think 30 to 40 percent of what you see out in the field in western Kentucky, well, all over the state, uh, is eventually exported. Um, and so there's a whole lot more that we can do trying to spread the message of the value of exports. I remember in Owensboro, we were proud of the fact that all the ragu spaghetti sauce in America is made right in Owensboro, Kentucky. And then we started exporting it to Italy. Wasn't that great? <laughs> 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 they ought to make a commercial out of that. Uh, but, but just, you know, the Hugh Hayden story yesterday about biopharmaceuticals with global implications. Uh, that's the world we live in increasingly, and I think we've got a bright future there if we stay focused and keep going. That's all I've got. Thank you, Bill. Uh. Thank you, gentlemen. A break until 3.15 and back in your seats uh, for the last session. <laughs>